You are framing your life with the thoughts that you are thinking right now. And God told me to tell you, it's time to change the frame. Are you trying to prove your point, or are you trying to keep the relationship? See, Paul said, I don't matter. It doesn't matter what their motive is. It matters what God's mission is. So, so you got to decide in your life. You got to decide what's going to matter to you. I live by the imagination that God has planted in me because I have lived my life by the Word of God. And the saddest thing, many of us are still living on instinct. Something happens, something comes. That's why fear grips you. They gave us a bad doctor report. What do we do? Instinct, freak out. Instinct, start calling everybody, sowing fear into everybody. You ain't even heard what the doctor said. They just called me. They just called me and said, death, bed, hospital, funeral. That's all you heard. Now you tell everybody else. And now instinct has seeped in. Now we all freaking out. Instead of living by the imagination of God, doctor calls before I call anybody. Father, you said in your word that I could speak to disease. See, y'all... It's so crazy that we come to church every day and you don't believe this stuff. Go somewhere else. Do so, like honestly, like do something else. Because until you start believing what God's word says, you only live out of instinct. But God's trying to give you an anointed imagination that then moves into a vision, that then goes into hope, that then turns into crazy faith. And then you get to a level where it's just crazier faith. Like, I didn't even believe for this, and God knew that he could partner with me, and we're about to do something that didn't even come across my mind. That's the scripture that says, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the imagination of those who love me. I didn't even think of this. But God wanted to do something. So then I started looking at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm just taking, today I'm just teaching you. I'm taking you on a Bible study with me. This is what happened to me during the week. God said, just walk them through it. Hebrews 11 verse three. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were, everybody say framed. framed. Underline that, circle that in your Bible. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen now were not made of things which are visible. That goes back to what we talked about last week, that God framed the whole world by words, but he did it with invisible, how did he do it? With things that weren't here? Things that weren't yet here? He framed the whole world and made it reality? It took me back to the phrase that we said, God's imagination created us. We are created in his image, therefore we can create with imagination. What are you saying? God saw it before he saw it. You have to see it. I don't know what it is for you, but you gotta see it before you see. You gotta see yourself being joyful before you see yourself actually in real life being joyful. You gotta see yourself being able to manage a lot before you see yourself actually being able to do it. Somebody say, see it before you see it. So when I looked at this scripture and I realized everything that we're looking at right now, God saw before we saw it. This word right here framed kept messing with me. So I looked up, y'all, I love the Bible. I looked up this word framed in different passages. Look at Psalms 103, verse 14. It says, for he knows our, everybody say frame. And he remembers that we are dust. So now I started doing the real pastory thing. And I went to look this word up in the Hebrew and the Greek. Let me tell you, y'all not gonna believe this. The word frame in the original Hebrew is a word called yetzer. Y-E-T-S-E-R, yetzer. Ain't never heard of a yetzer in my life. 
don't know where to find it yet, sir. And this had to be God. Do you know what the word yet, sir, means? Imagination. If you look it up, the word, it says, for God knows our imaginations. And he remembers that we are dust. You can see the same word in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. First Chronicles 29, 18. This is for all the Bible nerds that need to go study it, which should be all y'all. First Chronicles 28 and 9. God knows my imagination. Let me say it like this to you. Your imagination frames your life. Whatever you're imagining is the frame that God is building your whole life on. The life you have right now, you framed it. Stop blaming everybody else. It's not your family no more. You don't even live in that house no more. You are framing your life with the thoughts that you are thinking right now. And God told me to tell you it's time to change the frame. What are you saying, Pastor Michael? Let me give you an example that kind of hits close to home. This is a drum set that I want to show y'all from like uh, probably 1821. I don't even know. This mug is old. This drum set was top of the line, world-class drum set when it came out. But it only has the frame for one symbol, a cowbell, and a snare. That's all the frame can hold. This is our drummer, Tony's drum set. This mug is huge than a mug. <laughs> now I want everybody to see this real quick. This drum set is huge. It has a frame that can hold all of these, come with me, because they don't even know. They seeing it from the front. I want y'all to see how crazy this little boy has gotten with this drum set. No, 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 come on back here. I, I'm, I'm exposing it right now. There's symbols everywhere. There's electronic pads. There's all kinds of stuff. There's electronic double basses. There's four pedals down here. Do you need all? What's the difference between this drum set and that drum set? It's the frame it was built on. <sighs> I'm going to help him. This is what the frame of that drum set looks like. Look at this. This right here is the frame. I need somebody, camera, come on. Y'all, somebody come over here so they can see this. This is big enough to be able for me to imagine. When I build my drum set on this frame, there's all kind of options. There's all kinds of toms and cymbals and everything. That's the only reason that 1921 drum set doesn't have the frame to be able to build something great. God said to me, Michael, the saddest part about this crazier faith message I'm trying to get to people is most of them do not have the frame big enough for what I want to do in their life. They don't have, they've not believed me. They haven't taken the limit off of me. And today, when I looked at that word, yet, sir, and it said that the worlds were framed or imagined and that God knows our frame, our imagination. God said, Michael, the music I want to make in your life depends on the frame that you have. See, many people don't know this, but I've played drums since I was two. The difference between this drum set and that drum set on the screen is there's a lot more options here.
stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. What I was able to do and the sounds that came out and the expressions I was able to make were based on something that was built on a frame that was big enough for me to hold what I imagined. Pastor Mike, what are you trying to say? Could you imagine for more? I just, I feel like it's the rest of the weeks for most of you are going to be futile. If you don't get this one point, make the frame bigger. Take the limit off of God. He will not go past your belief to bring you into a place and a space that he already ordained for you. Ask the children of Israel. The promise from the beginning is I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm about to take you to a promised land. These people could not believe it. These people literally was like, we want to go back to slavery. Kill the guy who brought us out. Let's worship golden calves. They turned an 11 day journey into a 40 year death because they could not get a bigger frame for what God wanted to do. And what I'm telling you right now is a lot of y'all are out here being like, yeah, if God would just do this. And God was like, that is so little. That is so low. That is so whack. You just want to be married. That's it. You don't want to impact people with your marriage. You just want to be married. That's, you just want to be able to have sex with not feeling guilty. What? You don't want to raise generation after generation after generation that stands up and changes the trajectory of other people's life. You just want to have money. Or do you want to be able to change the trajectory of communities and be able to walk into situations and not pray for it, but be the answer to the prayer? Will you just widen the frame? I, st- I feel like an alien up here preaching because I've been to a planet that a lot of people never get to. I've started believing God for stuff that I can't say to people because it make you, it changed the way you thought about me. Now, when it happens, you're going to say I'm a man of faith. But right now, Amberly, there's stuff that God has shown me in the past two weeks since we started this series. I dare not utter because it would fry the belief of people who say they believe. And I said, God, why why is this? He said, because the frame is too small. Make the frame bigger. Write that down on your piece of paper. I'm going to make the frame bigger. Because your imagination frames your life. Now, the one thing you got to know about imagination, and I told you today, I'm not preaching to you. I'm teaching to you. Imagination is neutral. I want you to understand this. Your imagination is neutral. Your imagination can work for you and your imagination can work against you. Oh, but it's always working. Like, Brianna, it's uh, your imagination. Right now, some of y'all are imagining about what you're going to eat after this fast is over. (laughs) Right now, some of y'all done seen the steak. You already seen the Chinese food. I have seen the Chinese buffet, the nasty, dirty one. I go in there. I love that stuff. Hey, my God, I feel it. (laughs) I've imagined it. I'm there right now. (laughs) Wong tongs and all. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. But the thing you got to understand is your imagination is always working. Your imagination is neutral, though. It depends what you feed it of how it's going to produce for you. Okay, I'm trying to help you. All of this mental um, health that everybody's talking about right now. Do you know where all of these mental health issues come from? Your imagination. I'm asking God to help me decide in advance What are my distractions? And here's what Paul taught me. Not every disruption is a distraction. Remember, this is the apostle that's taking the gospel to the world, planting churches, and all of that progress has stopped, apparently. Paul said, actually, the gospel's moving forward. 
He decided what mattered. Did you? Or did you outsource your priorities to a broken world who doesn't know it's right from its left, it's up from its down? What, what does it matter? What does it matter? I wish I would have talked to Paul sooner. It would have been so good. I wouldn't have tried to chase people to get them to like me because I would realize that it's, it's not really what they think about me that matters. I would have, if I would have talked to Paul sooner, I could have realized that a human opinion is nothing compared to a divine seal. When God puts his seal of ownership on you, people can think what they want, say what they want. I mean, I'm just telling you, if I would have talked to Paul sooner, because I didn't know. So, because I didn't know, I got petty. I got petty. I got jealous. I got worked up. I got freaked out. I thought, oh my God. I mean, how many things if we could have talked to Paul when we were starting the church? How much time could we have saved worrying about stuff that didn't matter? Y'all, I got so possessed by this verse a couple years ago, I made bracelets for the whole church. Instead of WWJD, I made it uh, WDIM. What does it matter? But you know what? It's not if it's on a bracelet. It's in your brain. It is your thoughts. And I'm still asking it. Does it really matter? Does it really matter? Somebody told me, you should do the day and decade test. I was like, what is that? They were like, well, uh, if it won't matter in a day or in a decade, don't worry about it. That didn't help me too much, but here's what did help me. I didn't really get what they were trying to say. But here's what did help me. I did some flashbacks to stuff that frustrated me so badly and some stuff that had me so afraid that never happened. And as I was doing those flashbacks, and realizing God's faithfulness, it was an exercise for me. It was an exercise in asking a better question. The question, what does it matter, will eliminate 95% of my prayer requests. Right there. Just by asking God, give me your priorities. It will direct my resources, but it will start with the question. It is a clarifying question. Make it blurry, Abraham. Come on, Abraham. You remember Abraham and Sarah in the Bible? This is kind of crazy. In Genesis 18, Sarah was laughing because God said that, that she was going to have a baby. This is Genesis 18:12. And it says that Sarah laughed to herself. So she didn't LOL. She, uh, how would I go? Uh, LTH. She LTH. Do you see it on the scripture? She, LT, she laughed to herself. And look at this. She said, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I have this pleasure? I don't see how this could happen now. And then the Lord said to Abraham, Take it. Why does Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? And here's a better question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? See how that clarified it? You don't need an answer. You need to quit caring about stupid stuff. Hey, because I can worry about some stupid stuff. I can worry about some stupid stuff. Like, how and when and what are they going to say and what are they? That's what Paul was saying. It really doesn't matter what their motive is. It matters what God's purpose is. If it is God's purpose in my life being accomplished, it doesn't matter. I feel something on this. Say, I got too much purpose to be petty. I got too much purpose to be petty. I got too much purpose to be petty. Here was the key phrase to me. Are you ready? He said, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Let's talk about that phrase. Who put this table here? You don't even know. What was it put here for? That's the important thing. Yeah. It was put here so I could preach. So write this down. Who put it here isn't as important as why it was put here. When Paul says, I am put here for the defense of the gospel, he could have just as easily said, I was put here by Caesar because Rome is so wicked. But he didn't say any of that. 
He said, Rome might be the reason I got here from a human standpoint. Now, this is for anybody who's trying to figure out why this happened and why that happened. That is a bad question. The better question is, God, what are you doing right now in my life, and not how long are you going to leave me here? You notice Paul didn't ask that one time, how long is God going to leave me here? Instead, he asked the question, what am I put here for? I wonder what would happen if you asked that about your life. What was I put here for? Not who was I put here by. That's going to make you bitter because you're going to start blaming people. You're going to start blaming people who didn't support you. You're going to start blaming people who didn't encourage you. You're going to start blaming people who should have been there for you. But what you were put here for matters more than who you were put here by. I don't know, man. I just feel like God is anointing this message. God said, put a shrug emoji in the chat. He said, that is the official emoji of heaven over most of the stuff you're stressed about. The Lord said, I need you to make a list, a, 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 not a bucket list, What's the, like I don't care list. Like a list of like, I'm gonna quit caring about this so I can focus on that. Because I cannot care about everything. You know that, right? You know you were not designed to care about everything. Well, if you don't watch the news all the time, how are you gonna uh, be informed? My sanity matters more than my informedness. Talk to me back row. Talk to me back row. And I'm gonna tell you another thing that Holly said last week. She said, are you trying to prove your point, or are you trying to keep the relationship? See, Paul said, I don't matter. it doesn't matter what their motive is. It matters what God's mission is. So, so you got to decide in your life. you got to decide what's going to matter to you, what's going to matter to you in this season, what's going to matter to you in this moment. And you might have to come back to that a thousand times. Like I'm telling you, sometimes I just have to do this over and over and over again, and, and I've, got a, a flip phone. I've got a flip phone. I don't have a side chick. It's not some sketchy thing like that. It's just like i got a flip phone because sometimes I just can't care about and, and process everything all the time because it matters more to me to be available to God than accessible to everyone else. So I just can't care about everything. What does it matter? People ask me sometimes, you know, like, did you see what they said? I'm like, no. And they're like, do you want to know? No. They saw this thing about you. On, you want to hear? No, I don't want to hear. Control. Alt. Delete. Control, all, delete. It's a spiritual command function, right? Control, alt, delete. So I have got to change some priorities if I am going to expect God's resources. And they are connected. When Paul says, I expect that through your prayers and the provision of God's Spirit, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance, that doesn't happen. Unless he correctly answers the question, what does it matter? What does it matter? The stupid stuff. Um, it set me free because I used to think I, I embarrassed myself. I'd be like, oh man, I said this or I said that, I'm embarrassed. They don't care. People are paying way too much attention to themselves to care about anything you mispronounced or said wrong. <laughs> it's true. The, the greatest way for you to stop being so self-centered is to realize how self-centered everybody else is. Everybody's walking around going, God, I can't believe I said that. Like they're going home and studying the scripture of what you said. What does it matter? I preached one week, and my, my button was undone, and I didn't realize my button was undone. And I bet I stressed about that for three days. Like the button police were watching my YouTube. You know, how stupid is that? Here I am preaching the Bible, telling people that Jesus Christ is Lord and sovereign, and I'm stuck on a button. Now, y'all are looking awfully, awfully judgmental. I bet you've gotten stuck on some stuff 
So God said he will not control everything. He will not control your priorities. You will. You will decide what matters to you. What does it matter? What does it matter? Everything else is a distraction, you know? What does it matter? I'm so overflowing with things to tell you about this. Yet it would be irresponsible for me to not tell you that that can work both ways. Because just like you care too much about some stuff, there's some other stuff that, that you don't care enough about. Like for Paul, he, he, he had it clear. Remember, he said, It's clear to me. The important thing is Christ is preached. Good news, gospel, purpose, all that stuff. Well, I think if the devil can't distract you, he'll discourage you. I don't think he really cares how he takes you out. He just doesn't want you to know why you're here. In my study of the scripture, Paul's attitude reminded me a little of another prophet from the Old Testament called Elijah. He was a really powerful dude, but he had a lot of insecurities, I think. And I think that because it manifested in him tending to perform well in public, but to have problematic conversations and ask the wrong questions in private. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but, but he looked really good on the outside, right? You know, he looked really amazing on the outside, and he looked really powerful on the outside. But there is a scripture that was playing in my head, and I couldn't figure out why I kept thinking about it until I realized that, that just like you need to ask, what does it matter about some certain things and push them to the side in this season of your life? And I would ask that, what do you need to push to the side? That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. To make room for the things that do. There, there are also some times where, where the devil will try to convince you that something doesn't matter that actually really does. Like when Elijah called down fire on Mount Carmel and the false prophets were all put to death with the sword, you may know the story or you may not, really doesn't, really doesn't matter if you know all the details. There was one specific moment that was really on my heart to talk to you about because he, he went all alone after this great victory in his life, and, and he went to a cave, and, and he spent the night in a cave, and the voice of the Lord came to him in the cave. And you got to remember, the Lord didn't really shout. He whispered. And, and a lot of times, the Lord will, will be like a whisper. You know, he'll be like a whisper. He's not a remote control God. He's an up-close God, so he'll be like a whisper. And the question that he asked Elijah, not with a lot of decibels, but, but with a lot of clarity, he said, uh, what are you doing here? And what Elijah said next reflects where his heart was at. He said, uh, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. I hear in his response the words of a man who has done all that he can do and come to the conclusion that none of it matters. I hear a man that is at the end of his energy, who has given everything that he can for the people that he served. And I hear him almost like the opposite of Paul saying, What does it matter? It's never going to get better. Doesn't matter. Why even try? You remember when you preached, I'm tired of trying to change? I heard Elijah saying that. I'm, I'm sick of this. It's, not, it's outside of my control. I'm done. I'm drained. And I'm the only one left. The irony of it is, that he had enough faith for his words to control the weather system. He had enough faith to command a drought. But the question that would bring him out of depression is the question you must ask, what am I doing here? Paul asked that question, 
And he decided, I'm here for a purpose. And you know, that's a decision, that's an interpretation. That is not a fact on the surface, that is a product of his faith. He decided that. He decided that. He could have said, I'm here because it's unfair. I'm here because the system is broken. But focusing on what is broken will never set you free. I'm going to say it again. Focusing on what is broken will never set you free. So as long as your question is, why did they, and when will they, and how will they, God said, what is that? What have I called you to do? What has God called me to do? What has God given me in this season that can't be taken away? What can I control? What can I speak? What can I activate? How can I move it forward? What are the advantages? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares to defy the armies of the living God? They saw Goliath and said, how can we kill him? He's big. David said, how can we miss him? He's big. All you got to do, listen to me, child of God, all you got to do is change the question, even if you don't know all of the answers. And I feel like preaching because God said, no, I'm not going to give you an answer. I'm going to give you a better question. What are you doing here, you mighty man of valor? What are you doing here, you unique daughter of God? What are you doing in this place after you've seen me time and time again roll back the heavens and rend the sky and come down and crush your enemies. What are you doing here? See, he really wasn't running from Jezebel who threatened his life. He was running from himself because he had gotten the question wrong. 